Let us ever walk with Jesus, follow his example pure. Through a world that would receive us, and to sit our spirits lure. Onward in his footsteps treading, pilgrims hear our So glad you can join us. Uh, may God richly bless you. Uh, make sure you hit uh, hit subscribe, share this video with a friend. Um, if if you're blessed by this video, uh, share a comment, pray for us. Or if you'd like to share some gifts with us, um, you know you can send us an offering, um, or you can give online digitally. Uh, so may God richly bless you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving. We thank you for your great love for us, that you willingly gave up your son, Jesus, who went to the cross as us. As he went to the cross as us, there was a divine exchange that took place. We took on his righteousness, his perfection, and our sins got transferred to him. Father, we thank you through your that your son Jesus died on a cross for our sins so that we can be made righteous and be called your children. As we come before you today, we ask that you will strengthen our faith, that you would give us peace in our hearts, that you will help us to remember who we are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. been so, so kind to me. Before I took a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so
join me for confession and absolution. Heavenly Father, during this year, help us to recognize you above all else. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we might see you and recognize how you're at work through our lives. Forgive us when we fail to see that you are at work and give us the wisdom to make the best choices. Fill us with a desire to seek after you more than anything else in this world. Thank you that you are greater than anything we may face in our day. Thank you that your presence goes with us and that your joy is never dependent on our circumstances. We ask that your peace lead us, that it would guard our hearts and minds in you. We ask for your grace to cover our lives this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Upon this year confession, I have a virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The first reading is taken from the prophet Micah, the sixth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from 1 John chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the laws. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who was born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is from St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Blessings to you. So glad you can join us. Glad we can be uh, in your homes. Yeah, glad you can be viewing us through your smartphones, your iPads, uh, your digital devices, your computer. We're blessed that we can share God's word with you. Now, a man, a man wakes up. He realizes that he's in the middle of nowhere. He's kind of lost his memory. He doesn't remember who he is, who he was, or why he ended up in a secluded countryside. And so suddenly, in his confusion, a genie appears. And the genie asks, what is your third wish, my master? The man is confused. He says, who are you? Who are you? Why can't I remember anything? The genie replies, I am your genie. I am here because of your second wish to forget who you are and to take you away from a faraway place that you, that, that you do not recognize. Now, master, I'm in a hurry. What is your final wish? Well, the man can't remember anything. And the man says, my final wish is to remember everything about who I am. The genie bee starts laughing. What's so funny, the man asks. Well, the genie replies, that was your first wish. I guess life was too painful. He need to forget who he was. My dear friends in Christ, if you were to ask youth pastors or youth workers, what is the th one thing that young people today struggle with? And they would say their identity. Young people struggle with who they are. They struggle with if they matter at all. Now, now this identity crisis or this identity issue is not just confined to, to teenagers. In fact, even, even adults deal with this. I mean, I've, as a pastor, I've seen some uh, adult men struggle with this, especially when they can't or they're unable to perform at their job or they lose their job or maybe retire. They struggle with this because we live in a society that says, what is your name? What do you do? And oftentimes what you do is tied to our identity. So when a person retires, loses their jobs or loses their ability um, to do their job well, it feels as if their identity has been destroyed. I've also seen women struggle with this. Uh, those who stay at home with their children, raising their children. They feel inadequate, they, f they don't feel right because they f in part of them feels like they should be uh, this uh, career -orient independent, career-oriented woman. And then those women who have a career feel guilty. They feel like they should, they should be the ones, I mean, they feel guilty because they can't be so-called the perfect mom. So my dear friends in Christ, an identity crisis or identity issues is something that all people deal with. And especially for us today, we need to figure that one out. What does God say about us? All right, uh, if you do a quick search on identity crisis, you're gonna realize that um, there are no concrete answers um, there are no general consensus out there. In fact, if you um, Google it, you'll find out that, that you'll get advice that look inward or go, go explore, do things that you like. Okay. 
ignore judgment. So in so many, do, do whatever makes you happy. So in so many words, it's turning inward. Look inside you to figure out who you really are. Now, if you do it this way, it is troublesome because it seems like what, what these, the, this type of advice is telling us is the answer lies within you. H.W. Um, Tozer, a prolific author and pastor in the mid 20th century, um, he once wrote a book, and the book, and he quotes, the most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about God. In other words, when you think about God, what comes to mind? Now, whatever comes to mind will clearly affect your relationship with God. So he continues, it affects the rest of our lives. Now, if, if that is the number one thing, what is the number two thing then? Well, the number two thing is that what God thinks about you. Well, the number one thing is, okay, uh, what do you think uh, when you think about God? And the number two thing is, what does God think about you? Now, that is important as well. Have you ever thought about that? What does God think when he thinks about you? Is he happy with you? Is he disappointed with you? What does God think about when he thinks about you? Well, we're going to look at our, um, you know, we're concluding our, our National Lutheran School Week celebration. And um, our school has taken the opportunity to select a Bible verse for the entire year, like our theme verse. So that's why I'm going to be talking about this issue uh, from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, but we're not going to take the whole thing. And the theme verse is verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. Now, according to this verse, what's so exciting about this is that um, the reason why we are called children of God is because of the Father's great love for us. Next sentence, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So in other words, when people don't treat you or recognize you as God's chosen one or God's beloved children, it's because the world doesn't know him. Verse two, dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So once again, St. John drives home the point that you are a child of God, children of God. And so the comforting thing is, well, while we are waiting for the return of Christ, when he returns, we don't know exactly what we're going to be, but we do know we're going to be like him. And finally, verse three, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. What this means that is that those who believe that they are forgiven, beloved children of God, do not sin. They live a pure life because of their identity, because of who they are in front of God. It is their identity. So let's focus on uh, chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. You know, we live in a world that people say this about us, um, you know, you're a failure, you're fit, you're not fit, you're fat. There are so many words the world throws at us. But what does God say about us? You know, that is the most important thing. What is God saying about you? Now, according to this verse, see what great love the Father has lavished. See what great love. John is emphasizing this. Look, you are greatly loved. 
And so the first point is, you are loved, deeply loved. In John chapter 3, verse 16, the uh, nutshell of the, of the Bible, they call it, or the summary of the Bible in one verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The word for love here is agape, the Greek word agape, which means unconditional, perfect, sacrificial, and pure. For God so love you unconditionally. For God so love you, no matter what you're doing, no matter what condition you are, you are in, no matter what, you, what your past is, God loves you unconditionally. He loves you so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, uh, the New Living Translation, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, taking our place, taking our sins, we are made right with God. God loves you unconditionally. You know, there's a famous story um, in the Bible. Um, I believe it's John, John chapter four. Well, one time the religious leaders, now I think based on reading the text, it seems like this was a setup. Well, they got a woman who was caught in adultery they paraded her through the streets. Um, there was an angry mob that gathered. And, you know, according to the Old Testament, the book of Moses, um, you know, adulterers were stoned. Well, this woman was dragged before Jesus. And the religious leaders wanted Jesus to make a decision. Do we stone her or not? Now, this was a trap because this was, was a no-win. If Jesus said, let's stone her, she deserves it. Well, Jesus would get in trouble. The, the crowd would love to stone her. But if Jesus had stoned her, Jesus would be arrested by, by the Romans. And this would compromise his mission. His time had not yet come. And so if he said stone her, the crowd would gladly do it and he would get in trouble. Now, if he says leave her alone, now he would get in trouble for being a false teacher somebody who does not hold to the word, the Old Testament word of God, according to Moses in Leviticus, that, you know, a adulterer should be stoned. But wait a minute, I said this was the setup. Where's the man? So they, they did this to put Jesus in a bind. Well, as Jesus was drawing on the floor, he didn't say a word. The crowd kept pressing against The religious leaders said, what do we do with her? Finally, Jesus stood up and he said, he that is without sin, throw the first stone. Let me say that again. He that is without sin, throw the first stone. Whoa. He that is without sin, throw the first stone. Well, did you realize he, who's the he who has no sin? Only Jesus himself. Only Jesus is qualified to judge. He has no sin. He could have picked up the stone and thrown it at her, but he didn't. Instead, what happened is that he didn't throw the stone at her. He chose to love her unconditionally. He chose to save her. And so after saying those words, the mob, one at a time, from oldest to the youngest, left her alone. Why oldest to youngest? Because the older ones realized that they had more sin because of the years they had lived, and, they, and then the younger ones left. When everybody was gone, Jesus said to her, woman, where, I, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, she said, then neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. My dear friends in Christ, Jesus chose to love somebody like that. You are loved by God unconditionally. Philip Yancey, gold medallion book writer, wrote, 
There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There is nothing we can do to make God love us less. Do you understand that? You can sin. God still loves you. You can make terrible decisions. You can dig yourself into a deep hole. But you're still loved by God. Maybe you're suffering depression. Maybe you've made choices that you really regret. You are still loved by God. Max Licato writes, um, author, pastor Max Licato, there are many reasons God saves you, to bring glory to himself, to appease his justice, to demonstrate his sovereignty, but one of the sweetest reasons God saved you is because he is fond of you. He likes having you around. He thinks you are the best thing to come down the pike in quite a while. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be on it. He sends you flowers every spring and sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he'll listen. He can live anywhere in the universe, and he chose your heart. And a Christmas gift he sent you in Bethlehem. Friends, face it, he is crazy about you. He loves you unconditionally. Sometimes we have to say it ourselves. I am loved by God. Sometimes when we're going to a tough time or we wake up in a terrible mood, when we have stuff to deal with, we need to say it out loud. I am loved by God. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are, and that's exactly what we are. Since we are loved by God, we are also his children. You are his child. There's a professor uh, of homiletics. Um, in fact, I didn't have him as a professor but yet I had to read his books in, book in seminary. Now he shared a story, a very interesting story about the power of knowing your identity. Well, Fred, Fred Craddock um, was, his, is his name, was his name. He was a distinguished professor of preaching at Emory University. In fact, when he died, CNN um, wrote an article called, a, called him a preaching genius. He died at the age of 86 in 2015. And um, one summer, Fred Craddock, his name is Fred Craddock, he, was tra he traveled to Gatling, Tennessee, just for a short vacation with his wife. They wanted to be away to decompress. They wanted to find a quiet place. Well, one evening, they found a quiet restaurant where they could enjoy a quiet evening. Well. While they were waiting for their meal, they noticed a white-haired gentleman. He was going from table to table, greeting the guests. Well, Fred said to his wife, I hope he doesn't come over here. Well, he does. He does. The man came by and says, where are your folks from? And they said, Oklahoma. He said, splendid, I hear. I've never been there. But what do you do for a living? The man, Fred, says, I teach homiletics at the graduate department of the seminary of Phillips University. Oh, he said, you teach preachers, huh? Do you? We've, well, I got a story for you to tell you. Oh, no, was Fred's response. He didn't say it, say it out loud. Here's another preacher story. So the man pulled up a chair and sat, and sat at their table and he begins to talk. He sticks out his hand, he says, I'm Ben Hooper. I was not born far from here, over near the mountains. Okay. My mother was not married when I was born, and so I had a really hard time growing up. At school, they would call me terrible names, and oftentimes I would be alone because I just couldn't deal with the name calling. He says one experience was, you know, was the most horrible was when he had to go downtown on Saturday. 
He said everybody would look at him and stare at him as if they were asking, who is your father? Well, Ben, this was really hard for Ben growing up. Then he said, well, suddenly there was a new pastor in his church when he was 12 years old. He said normally he would come to church late and leave early so that he would never have to say a greet or interact with anyone. Well, on that particular Sunday, his pastor said the benediction really fast. And so he had to exit while the crowd was exiting. Well, suddenly he felt a hand on his shoulder. Um, it, was the, it was the new pastor. And, and when he turned around, he asked a question, who are you, son? Whose boy are you? Oh no, that question? He felt like it was now even the pastor was drawing attention to his problem here. It felt, he said he felt like there's a dark cloud over his head. Well, the pastor started examining him, looking at his face, looking at him carefully, and it seems as if he had found a resemblance. And he said, wait a minute, I know who you are. I see the family resemblance. You're, you're a son of God. With that, the pastor slapped him on the back and he says, you've got a great inheritance, go claim it. Well, the old man uh, looked at Fred and said, that was the most one, that is the most important sentence that someone had ever said to me. Then he smiled and he moved on to the next table. Shortly after, Fred suddenly recalled, wait a minute, on two occasions, the people of Tennessee elected a, a, govern, a governor who was born out of wedlock for two terms, Ben Hooper. He served two terms as the 31st governor of Tennessee from 1911 to 1915. He also served two terms in the Tennessee House of Representatives from 1893 to 1897. What is God saying about you? What does his word say? You are loved unconditionally. You are his child. Say it with me. I am a beloved child of God. Some days when you're going through a tough time, you got to say it out loud. I am a beloved child of God. Since you're a beloved child of God, Let's keep reading. See what great love, and repeat that verse, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. Since we are that, then we can face tomorrow with courage, and we can be strong. We can face tomorrow with strength and courage. St. Paul wrote, if God is for us, who can be against us? If you're loved unconditionally by God and you're his child, who can be against you? Nothing. When Joshua was taking over the leadership uh, roles when Moses was dying, he would succeed Moses. Now this is a daunting task, if you remember, Israel only knew Moses as the best leader. In fact, remember the 10 plagues, all the miracles they had experienced with Moses. Now here Joshua would be the next leader when Moses dies. He had a really daunting task ahead of him. He was charged with leading God's people, this could be two million people, into the land, the promised land, Canaan. And so notice what God says, in Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, you know, the enemies. For the Lord your God goes with you. God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So the God, so the God that loves us, 
the God that calls us his children, he goes with us. He promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And so because you are loved, because you are his child, you can be strong and courageous. Now let me bring this to a close here um, with a very famous poem. Um, you, can, you can see it adorned in um, keychains. In fact, uh, people have it up on their, on their walls, in their houses. Uh, in fact, um, it's a very famous one called Footprints, uh, Footprints in the Sand. The poem goes like this. One night, I dreamed a dream. I was walking along the beach with my Lord. Across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. Each scene I noticed two set of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. And so this, the setting here is that, that you know, this person's life is flashing before them. They're walking along the beach and the Lord is walking with them. There are two set of footprints. Poem continues. When the last scene of my life shot before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. There was only one set of footprints. I realized that this was the lowest and saddest times of my life. This always bothered me, and I questioned the Lord about my dilemma. And so this person realized when they look back at the most difficult times in their lives, they realize that there was only one set of footprints. And so they, this person descended, decided to ask the Lord, Lord, you told me when I decided to follow you, you would walk and talk with me all the way. But I'm aware that during the most troublesome times of my life, there's only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I need you most, you leave me. Friends, sometimes that's how it feels. Sometimes when we're going through the pits of life, sometimes we're going through a loss, sometimes we're going through a very difficult period. It feels like we're all alone. It feels like the Lord is not with us. He, but here's the Lord's answer in the poem. My precious child, I love you and will never leave you, never ever during your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. You see, the reason why we see one set of footprints, it is when the Lord carries us because you're his precious child. It's like the father who comes and picks, picks the hurting child up. There's only one set of footprints. So my dear friends in Christ, you are loved. God loves you unconditionally. You are his child, his beloved child. You can be strong. You can be courageous because you are a child of the Most High God. He never leaves you. He will go with you. He will carry you, especially in the most difficult points in your life. May God richly bless you. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Lord, we thank you for your great love for us, that you've made us your children. We thank you that through your son Jesus, he paid the price so that this can happen. As we come before you today, we ask that you will remind us of our identity, remind us of who we are each and every day so that we can live for you because, some, because a child of God does not willfully sin because we love you. Lord, we thank you for all of your promises. We thank you for all that you've given to us, our friends, our family, our churches, our community. We ask that you will watch over every one of us, that we would grow in our love for you, our love for our community, and our fellow friends and family. We thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and a power, and a glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Thank you.